What can we do to reverse global warming? Become aware of the solutions and think about the actions you can take as you listen to how we are drawing down in Pennsylvania. The ocean. The sound of crashing waves is the one we're familiar with. What we can't hear, and what isn't always visible to us, is the warming temperature of this body of water that covers 71% of our planet. The warming ocean water doesn't just impact marine species and ecosystems, but it impacts humans as well. Being the newest incoming sector of Project Drawdown, the ocean plays a critical role in regulating the Earth's climate. Dr. Adrian Oakley, Associate Professor of Geology and Marine Science at Cutstown University, located in Pennsylvania, discusses how and why the ocean is important in regulating the Earth's climate. The first thing you want to think about is that the ocean serves as a giant thermostat for the ocean. So the thermostat in your house regulates your temperature. When it's too hot, right, you turn on the heat, you set it to the temperature you want. And you can think of the ocean as playing a part in doing that for our planet. So the ocean, through ocean currents, both surface currents and deep ocean currents, actually distributes heat from the equator and the tropical regions up to the poles and helps make it so that the equatorial oceans don't boil, we get excess sunlight there, and the polar regions don't freeze solid. So the oceans have this huge effect on our climate. And part of this is also really important because of the properties of water. So water has what we call a really high heat capacity. And what that means is that it can take in or lose a tremendous amount of heat without actually changing temperature. So if you think about sand in the morning, if you get to the beach in the morning at 8 a.m. when you're starting to put out all your stuff, you can walk across the parking lot and the sand without any shoes on because it's not very hot. But say you run back to the car at noon after the sun's been beating down, that sand's really hot. So things like rocks have a very low heat capacity, so they change temperature very quickly. The ocean changes temperature very slowly. So it can absorb a tremendous amount of heat without actually changing temperature. So without the oceans, the level of warming of our planet would be much higher. So it's very critical in that sort of that idea of how does it help regulate Earth's climate. The oceans also play a crucial role in weather. So not just the long-term climate patterns, but pretty much our everyday weather. The ocean absorbed vast quantities of heat as a result of increased concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, mainly from fossil fuel consumption. The fifth assessment report, published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, also known as IPCC, in 2013 revealed that the ocean had absorbed more than 93% of excess heat from greenhouse gas emissions since the 1970s. This is causing the ocean temperature to rise. Dr. Oakley explains how the changes in atmospheric greenhouse gases in the ocean have varying impacts. So the oceans absorb, I think it's, it's probably a little bit more than two-thirds of atmospheric CO2. Again, the oceans take in, they're a huge sink is what we call it. They take in a tremendous amount of atmospheric CO2. So that actually helps regulate the amount of warming in our air, in our atmosphere. But the also thing you have to think about is that small changes in the ocean temperature specifically, have a huge effect on organisms. If we warm up the air by a couple of degrees or the, you know, the planet as a whole by a couple of degrees, it does have an effect. But increasing the temperature of the oceans by one or two degrees, it, like the same idea as raising your body temperature a couple of degrees, that can have a significant effect of fever for a long period of time. It's not going to be good for a human. Changing the temperature of the ocean 
and having it be warmer for long periods of time is going to have a huge effect on ocean organisms like corals and several others. The other thing we have to think about is not just temperature, but the other effect of increasing the amount of CO2 in the ocean. Right, so if the oceans are absorbing two-thirds of atmospheric CO2, we're increasing atmospheric CO2, we're putting more CO2 into the oceans, and what that can lead to is an increase in the acidity of the ocean. So the oceans are becoming more acidic. It's a process called ocean acidification. This doesn't mean you're going to be swimming in lemon juice. The oceans aren't ever going to be, you know, like stomach acid type of acidity, but it is going to be acidic enough that it will actually start affecting the organisms, especially the organisms that are composed of calcium carbonate. They make their shells. So these are things like corals and oysters. So ocean acidification is another consequence of increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in the oceans. This is Caroline Latlow, born and raised in Pennsylvania and a recent graduate of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst with a master's degree in geoscience focusing on coastal tidal wetlands and coastal flooding. Ms. Latlow emphasizes one of the challenges scientists face when studying the ocean. The ocean is also really difficult to monitor, which I think is one of the really big issues is that it is absorbing a lot of the greenhouse gases that we talk a lot about, especially carbon dioxide and methane. The ocean kind of takes these from the atmosphere and absorbs them. And monitoring a fluid, you know, it's really difficult to tell where the pollution is coming from. Dr. Oakley shares what role Pennsylvania plays in the ocean sector of Project Drawdown. I think the biggest thing that people in Pennsylvania can do is be aware. Be aware that their actions and their decisions and and how they vote and the people that they vote into office are going to have a huge effect. Pennsylvania, you know, it's referred to as a battleground state. We're a very important political state, but we're also an incredibly important state in terms of, of innovation. If you think about all of these, this technological revolutionary things, you know, between the steel and the, I mean, we've done, and even oil and gas, you know, a lot of that was discovered in Pittsburgh. We have so much industry and infrastructure in Pennsylvania that We could lead the way on a new industrial revolution, but a greener industrial revolution. What I mean by that is, you know, people in Pennsylvania could be leading the way for more renewable energy technologies. And anything that can help bring down the amount of CO2 and bring down our reliance on natural gases and these resources that are our fossil fuels that will disappear. I mean, we will run out of them. It's kind of a a self-limiting thing. We will run out of them. If Pennsylvania can lead the way in these new innovations for technology for the future that is going to not cause the same level of atmospheric grasses to rise or, or even technology that can draw it down. That is something that I think Pennsylvania is is really set up for. And the people of Pennsylvania need to make sure that they're the people that are in office and voting from the local scale, whether it's in your town, all the way up to the president of the United States, the people are having this conversation. We need to make sure that climate change and variability and the future of our planet is a topic that people are talking about is something that they're not going to ignore. So increasing that, making sure that the people that we vote into office are willing to have the conversation. These aren't easy conversations. We need to think about oil and gas production in Pennsylvania isn't going to go away, neither is coal. We have so much natural gas here. This is a huge part of our economy, but we need to make sure that the money that is going into or coming out of those industries are being taxed and are going into creating a a better future. So some of that money needs to be funding some of these other initiatives. So we need to think about how we relate to the oil and gas industry in Pennsylvania and really 
make sure that this is a conversation that is being had from the preschool level to the to the retirement homes. The people are having these conversations and voting is free. It's not something that's going to cost anyone money. In terms of you know, small scale, we're kind of at the point now where, where individual actions are very important. And if people are, but I, you know, I don't want to make anyone feel bad. If you can't, if you're in a place where you can't recycle or compost, do what you can. Individual actions, we're kind of at a point where we actually, it, those won't be enough. We need collective large scale actions to make a difference right now to solve these problems with the oceans and our changing planet as a whole. So we need collective action. But I still think people can make small changes in their lives to make things better. But I don't want to tell everybody that they have to start their, you know, start their compost or they're a bad person if they drive to work. You don't want to make anyone feel bad. You want to make sure that people can take small actions. So you can use your reusable straws and stop using single-use plastics. You can try to just reduce waste overall. You can make whatever choices you feel comfortable about in terms of your personal diet. But in general, we need big scale collective actions if we are going to make a difference. Ms. Latlow echoes Dr. Oakley's suggestion of getting involved with advocating for science with policymakers. And I, I highly recommend visiting congressional offices either in your district or in D.C. if you're close enough to do that, especially in Pennsylvania, which isn't very far from D.C., but the congressional offices often take breaks and will go back to their home districts at certain parts of the year. And so calling them or writing them letters about issues that you really care about or policies that you've heard about or research that you're interested in, whether it's about the ocean or climate or agriculture, Any of those things are really valuable ways of communicating with your congressional representatives. It's it's really great to be part of part of our democracy and really putting out what you think is important to someone who is listening. One final note is that we should all have hope, just like Dr. Oakley. The fact that awareness is increasing. And it has in the last few years, even the last couple of decades, people are becoming more aware of the effects of climate change, the effects on our ocean of things like sea level rise and erosion and ocean acidification. There, There's more information out there. There's documentaries like Chasing Coral. There's lots of even the David Attenborough BBC series. There's lots of conversations being had that are making this a topic of conversation in lots of households. And that awareness gives me hope because we're not just saying, oh, we're in a landlocked state. Why should we care? A lot of people are starting to realize they can have an effect and their actions are affecting the oceans. So the awareness, that level of awareness is huge. And that, that definitely gives me hope. Thanks for listening. This is Anna from Penn State Brandywine.